life. Well, it's almost over. I was actually looking at the schedule just now. So we're here, right? Yeah. So there's two more. So next week we're going to do uh, a kind of applications focus on, on robotics. And then we're going to have a final review. And then the final is going to be in class the in the Sun Lab. Two weeks? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah? Uh, is the final cumulative? Or yes, it's going to be cumulative. Um, we wanted it to be cumulative, and we didn't want it to try to squish everything into one class. And we, our final slot was the last day of finals week, so if we did it during finals week, everybody would have everybody would have had to stay around till all the, all like through that Friday, and we didn't want to do that to you guys. So we made the decision to do it in class um, in two parts, so that you can um, not have to stay around it or over finals week, but we can still do a comprehensive final. Yes parts from like the two halves of the course? I haven't decided. Um, it's definitely going to be comprehensive, but I was thinking it might be better to kind of mix things up instead of doing it in, in chronological order. Um, yes? Um, for the first midterm, can we see the questions so that we can understand? Yeah, that, that should be. Is there already up, Pat? We'll put it up uh, as soon as possible. I'm just need to figure yeah. out yeah. And our plan, uh, my plan is to make it like the midterm in, in terms of the way we asked the question. It's going to be on edX again. We're going to try to have more higher level of questions, sort of, sort of try to apply your knowledge in, in different settings and, and, and without, without having quite as much sort of algorithmic re reproduction. Although they're still going to be. So, so, so we've, we sort of had, had a few different types of questions. So one type is like run this algorithm either in code or in your head and show us, like we check if you're doing it right. Um, and we're going to have some of those questions. My plan is to have some of those questions on the final, but I also want to have some more short answer. Um, when do you think this is a good idea? When do you think that's a good idea? Constructive application focused questions um, as well, so that you can sort of really try to show us that you can apply your knowledge in uh, problems maybe we haven't talked about in class, but they're kind of similar. Any more questions? All right. So here's our plan for today. So we're going to talk about, uh, so this is our last lecture on reinforcement learning as such. If you like this stuff, Michael Lippmann teaches a course about it. Um, I actually don't know if it's offered uh, in the fall or in the spring. I think it's, oh, he's not offering it next year. Oh, every other year. OK. So in two years, you can, you can take Michael's course. Um, and you can also, you know, um, if, you're, if you're interested in pursuing further, Amy Greenwald also thinks about these kinds of things in more mul uh, multiplayer settings, so like when you have like an adversary and, and as part of your, of your MVP. And I do too. So, so a, a few of you have talked to me about, uh, about doing research with me or with some of the other faculty uh, around here. So if you're interested in pursuing anything in this course further, really, um, doing research with some professor in the department is a really great, great way to do it. Um, and coming out of this course, uh, the computer vision people, so like Eric Sutterth and, and James Hayes, Eugene Charniak, the, and me and the robotics people, Chad and, and Michael and me, uh, and Amy. I think that's everybody. Pedro Feltzenschwab in engineering. There's probably a few more that I'm forgetting. But there's sort of a number of faculty around here that, that um, do research in these different areas. OK, so we're going to uh, sort of finish up uh, with, so RMAX and policy search are, the, are, are sort of this, so we're in this like spectrum of RL, right? So there's um, policy-based, where we're just going to directly try to estimate the policy. That's sort of what policy search is going to be about. And then value function based. So, so that's our Q learning algorithm, if you remember from last time. We were estimating the value function, um, either directly with a tabular representation and just trying to keep, keep counts. Or we talked briefly about linear function approximations. So you have features, and you're trying to do feature weights. And the whole thing it's trying to predict is your Q or your U, your, your value function, how valuable each state is. And then you do this thing. With the Bellman equation, once you have the value function, you use the Bellman equation to get a policy. Here, you just get the policy directly. And then uh, the sort of final strategy you can do is called model-based. So the idea is to directly estimate the model of the MDP, the transition matrix and, and the reward function, and then uh, solve the MDP using your favorite algorithm, value iteration or, or something else, to actually convert that to a policy. So, so we started out with the, the value function based uh, version of Q learning because it's kind of it's actually pretty simple to implement and it's it's very direct. Maybe we should have started with policy based. But we started out in the middle. Today we're going to do this one and and this one. 
Um, so here's our, our Q learning algorithm again, and this is showing the update that we were doing uh, to estimate our Q function um, based on the TD error. So that's the thing that we're storing. And then once we have the Q function, we, we do our argmax over the actions, find the action with the best Q, and, and do that to actually use our policy. So for our max, I was going to ask you guys this, I, but I just said it. Um, what we're going to do instead is estimate the MDP parameters. So the parameters of the MDP that we need to know that we don't know are the reward function and the transition function. And then once you have a reward function and, tra and transition function, you can do, we can go back to the, the sort of all of our bag of tricks of MDPs. You can do value iteration or something else to act optimally according to the model. Okay. And then, um, and then there's this trick because you have, like, as you're doing this, you have to figure out when to explore and when to exploit. And, and for our max, they have this trick that unexplored actions, we're just going to assume that they have the highest possible reward. And, and what that, so what's that going to make it do? Yes, right. So, so is that good or bad if we always explore? Always, always. Yeah, because we're never going to actually try to use what we've learned. Um, so, so this is true actually at the beginning of, of running the algorithm, but what do we have to do to, to actually have it start to exploit? Yeah? Decrease the assumed reward. Um, yeah, so, so as, we, as we get more data, we're, we, we'll start out assuming we have the highest possible reward, but as we get more data, we're, we're going to have like, probably, the wor maybe we're in a world where every, everything always is happy and we can just do whatever we want. But probably not. Probably our, our estimates of the reward function are going to be lower than this optimistic assumption once we've visited those states and have, have gotten a good enough estimate. So what Armax is going to do is assume that all the places I haven't been are really awesome until I've actually been there. Once I've been there, then I know something about what the reward function looks like and the transition function. And then I'm going to use those estimates uh, instead. So, so it, it's, that's sort of how it controls uh, explora exploration versus exploitation. Uh, OK. So here's pseudocode for it. I should actually link this. This is from a paper, a review paper. Um, we don't give pseudocode in the, on, the, on the problem side. And it's not in the textbook because it's a pretty new thing. Um, so, so this is a pseudocode we're, we're going to follow to implement. And, and it's kind of funny. This is one of the ones where like, they say in the paper about RMAX, it's really simple to implement. But when you compare it to like, Q-learning or the policy search method, there's actually quite a lot of stuff going on uh, in, this, in this algorithm. Be and, and the reason for that is because we have to you know, do a lot. We've, we've got to actually estimate two things, the, the transition matrix and the reward, ma and the reward function matrix. And so, so it's like we have to do the bookkeeping to do that. And then once we have that, we have to do, we actually just have to call value iteration on all that stuff to, to use uh, what we're estimating in order to, to do good things. So it's kind of a lot of work to do the model-based uh, version of things. Because not only like, do you have to have all these you know, variables around, you have to actually have to have a model. Like you have to decide how the transition matrix is going to look and how the reward matrix is going to look. And, and here we're just going to use a tabular presentation, but you might have more assumptions about where it comes from. Yes? So when it says loop and end loop, like what yep. determines whether we're going to stay in that loop? How much data that we have. So, so, um, so for each cycle here, it's going to pick an action from its policy. We'll just sort of, sort of maybe walk. So this is like initializing stuff. So initializing our stuff to our max. We're going to each time get our policy, which we got using value iteration. We're going to pick an action based on our current state. It's optimal with respect to this, our best guess of a policy. Then we're going to do our bookkeeping. So all of this is bookkeeping about how to, how to uh, do the, and here we observe the reward in the S prime. And then, and then we call value iteration after we do our bookkeeping to get a better policy based on what we just learned. And then we do it again. So, so typically, this is limited by um, how, many, how, long, how many CPU cycles you have or if you're running this on a robot, like how long you feel like running the robot for, or if you're running this on a corpus or, or, or sort of an offline mode, how much data you have. So okay. it's essentially like, it's not defined. The longer, yeah, it's, 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 the lo yeah, it's, it's basically your, your standard machine learning. I think I drew this picture before. Um, the more data you have, the more error you get. And the longer you loop, the farther you are on this curve. And where you want to stop depends on stuff outside the scope of this algorithm. OK. All right. So let's do it.
Okay. So here is my, and we're going to do this in, in Bandit World still. I started doing this in the Russell Norvig grid, but I felt like both that it was too close to the, to the project, so it was almost doing the project for you. And I felt like that was taking something away. And also, in the context of a lecture, it was a lot harder to see what the algorithm was actually doing. There was just so many parameters flying around that it was harder to show you what's happening. So we're going to stick in, uh, in the bandit world. Um, so let me make, make this bigger. And let's make this bigger. And what I have right now running is stub code for both RMAX and policy search. So, the, so it's going to print these results again. Um, so this is our random agent. Our optimal agent is just deterministically looking at the, you know, looking inside the slot machine and picking the one with the best answer. Um, Thompson sampling, so the same thing from last time. Hue learning from last time. And then these guys are, are, are doing nothing right now. So, so maybe I'll even take out policy search so it doesn't confuse you. Um, do that again. So um, def rmax. So here is our, our stub code for, for rmax. Um, and basically, if you remember from last time, we have this, um, maybe I'll show you the random to refresh you on the, the setup for these bandit guys. So we have this random agent for each cycle, for each time it gets to make a choice. It's going to, here it's going to randomly pick something, and the other one's going to do something based on its learning. It's going to um, get a reward from that, and it's going to yield that back out and just keep doing that. Uh, and then there's this extra infrastructure to do that a lot and get the statistics and stuff. So for our RMAX guy, um, which is right here, I've set up some of the variables that we need in advance because it didn't seem like worth doing all that in class. Uh, but basically what it's doing right now is the same thing as the, ran as the random guy. It actually might be deterministic because I'm calling, I'm initializing the reward matrix and the transition matrix, and then I'm calling the, like once you have that, you can, you can get the optimal policy. So, so I have this helper function that gets the best thing and then, uh, and then samples the reward from that. So, so this is going to be easily, whatever the initialization happens to pick, it's going to deterministically return that policy. So if we go up and see. Um, so all it's doing is computing the expected reward for the different actions based on its T and its R. Okay? Is everybody with me? We're just stuck, like, getting the initialization happy. OK, cool. All right, so, so then uh, the way this algorithm works, if we go back to the pseudocode, um, what we're going to do is initialize, we're going to have this like, special state SR, which is our absorbing state. It's not a real state. It's a state we're going to hallucinate. And we're going to pretend like we're in this, you know, the opposite of regret. Like we're going to live in this happy land where the reward from being in that state and doing anything is our max. And the transition, once you're in this state uh, and you stay in this state, uh, it's our max. And here, this is uh, so the other part of the installation. When, you're, when you see a new state, the effect of taking a new action, the, you're going to initialize your reward to be our max. And you're going to assume that that state takes you to your happy place of happiness. OK? Does that make sense to everybody? This, this sort of, so th these two pieces are doing the initialization. Why can't we do all the initialization up here? Why don't we? Yeah? Because you don't know what all your possible states Yeah, right. So, so down, we have to do it inside the loop, because we might be encountering, like, we, I guess we could in our bandit problems, but sort of in general. You have to do it down here, because you might, as you encounter states, you can't, you can't assume you can enumerate through all of the states to do the initialization. So it's happening in the other half of this if statement. Um, so the first half of this if statement is saying it uh, is, is sort of looking at these counts. So the bookkeeping that we have to do is, is storing R and T, and also the number of times we visited these states and taken that action, and the number of times we've observed when we do that, we go to a particular transition matrix. So that makes sense. It's, it's like a ma uh, we'll, and we'll basically use that to make a maximum likelihood estimator for the transition probabilities. Is that, is that cool? You're looking confused. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. No. Oh, there we go. Now it won't fit. All 
All right, I'll just do this. How's that? Okay. Um, all right. So, so, so basically what we're going to do is update these counts for how many times we were in S, we took action A and we observed S prime, and how many times in general we were in S and we took action A. Okay, so this is going to be all the times we were in S and did S A and did A, and this is all the outcomes that happened when we did that. And then we're going to keep track of the reward. So, so every time we were in S and we took action A, we got some reward for doing that. And, that's, and that, that total reward is stored in R sum. Okay? So our bookkeeping step is basically going to say, if we've been in this state enough times, it's where M is an arbitrary threshold that you pick, um, then once we, once we decide that we've explored it enough to like, rely on our estimate, uh, then we do this update. We update our reward function by doing this maximum likelihood estimate. So we divide the total reward by the number of times we've been in that state, and that's the sort of expected the mean of, of reward we've observed, yep. Is it, is it the number of times you've been in that state or the number of times you've been in that state and taken action? Number of times you've been in that state and taken action A. Yeah. More question? Okay. And then, um, and then the same thing for the transition matrix. So we're just going to loop through all of the S primes that we've observed and make uh, empirical transition probabilities. So the number of times we went ended up in S prime divided by the number of times we were in S and we took A. Okay, That's, so it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the way this estimate's happening. And then once you have R and T, you call VI, you get a policy, you do it again. Okay, so let's look at the code of, of this. Let's see if I... Um, so, so basically what I have is this default dick jazz is basically, make, don't, like it looks kind of scary, but all it means is we're initializing everything to be zero without having to call set default and have lots of complicated initialization code. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a, yeah, because um, in a lot of weird errors, like, you know, this doesn't exist yet, and you've got to check if it exists and put it in. Um, this is just taking a little lambda to, to, to make it. So, so basically, R, it takes an S and then an A. I think there's an example here. R takes an SR and then an A, and I can just set it to be R max. And if I ask any other value, if I ask for any other value without setting it, it'll return zero here because of this lambda. Okay? Nobody's, everybody's okay with that. Okay, so I have my R, my T, my C. So I'm calling, I'm making two matrices. One is, one is C of S of A and SP. So that's my, my, how many times I ended up in SP when I was in S and took action A. And C of S A uh, is how many times I was in S and took action A. And then the default dict, uh, uh, sorry, the R sum, the number of times I was in S and A, and which reward I got. And then I'm just making my state. So this is like I'm, this is simpler because of the bandit world. I'm just going to make two states, S R and S, like my initial my initial banded state. And I'll set my R max to be one. That's a parameter. You have to tell it uh, uh, what it is. And in our bandit world, we know it's one. So sometimes it's interesting, like s things sneak in from the model. Like technically, you're not supposed to know that. Um, and and one of the things they they look at is like what happens if you give it bad values for R max? If it's too high or if it's too low, it might overexplore or something um, when it's already maybe found an op like if it's found an optimal solution maybe it should do that instead of, of uh, R maxing um, okay so then the first thing it's doing is just this initialization step from the pseudocode and then we're gonna do our, our loop so so this initialization basically says if you're in your happy state everything is good and otherwise it's not Okay, so, so, and then the first thing here of choosing an action A, that's happening already. Um, we already talked about that. And then uh, we observe R and S prime. So we're going to just assume that our S prime is equal to S because this is our bandit world. We just know that S takes us back to our start. Um, so now we're going to do our increment. So what does that look like? Here's the pseudocode. Yeah. Action, then C, yeah. So let's do that. So I have to say C of S, A, S, P of S and best AI plus equal one. Oh, yeah. Three. Yeah. Like this. So we're assuming our next state is SP is always our current state because of the bandwidth. This is going to be different for you guys when you, you, you can't make that assumption. You don't have to actually use SP. And then C of SA of S 
best AI plus equals one. I'm just going to ke keep maintaining my counts. And then let's look at the next thing. My R sum, so R sum S A plus equals R. All right, now what? Yeah. Right. So if C S A S best A I is greater than or equal to M, and I just set it to be 10 up there, else we'll put some passes. All right. So now we're going to do our computation of the reward. So, sorry. So we're going to say R. S A equals R sum of S A divided by C A S A. Yes, over C S A S. And I'm doing this wrong, actually. It's supposed to be the one I actually took. And I had to make sure this is one of those annoying Python things. These are 0 0.0s. So it's, it's OK not to, it already floats. Um, hopefully things will be OK. And then next thing is our transitions. What's that? So, so, so this next thing is going to basically check for all the places I could end up in uh, after taking A, I'm going to update my counts. So, so what is this in our bandit problem? Since I always end up back in my, my current state. <laughs> Yeah, so I just have to do this. I don't actually need a for loop here. I can just do this once. So t of s a s equals <coughs> c. Where is it just be one? Wouldn't it just be one? Yeah. You yeah. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, you're right. I think it would. Yes. So in our banded problem, we don't, maybe don't even need to do this, um, but I will do it because. It fits into their, their framework. It's closer to what you guys are going to have to do for your things. And it'll make my policy thing, thing work. But yeah, it's going to always be one in this world because it's always going to transition back. So C of S, um, A, S, P of S, best A, I, S over C, S, A, S, best A, I. All right. So that's my um, update. And then. If I don't do this, I have to initialize. I have to remember that I've seen this world. So I say R of S best AI equals R max. And T of S best AI SR equals 1. So I'm going to assume my utopia state. OK? So let's try. I think that's. SR is like our hallucinated utopia state. So at the beginning, I'm assuming that everybody ta everything takes me to that utopia before I've been there. Um, kind of relevant to bandits, but we'll take it. All right, so let's try it. Let's see if there's a bug or what. Sad. What's that? I'm pretty sure. So here's what we can do to debug this. Um, what's that? I am I'm calling our max policy up here. Um, so let's print R and see what's happening. And if it takes too long, I have I have a cheat sheet. We'll just swap that one in. Oh, actually, I have one more helper thing. So it's uh, it's printing. A, 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 the default dict is nice, but like it it puts all this weird stuff about the the lambda expression in it before it gives you the actual dict. So I just had a little helper method that that only prints the dict of of what's going on. All right. So this is saying the, oh, at the beginning of time, my reward function only knows about the utopia state. Whatever action I take, one, two, or three, I'm going to end up in utopia. I'm going to get my R max, my plus one reward. 
So let's do an update and see what happens now. So here, I, I actually did an update. I ended up in, so here there's two things now, right? Um, I pulled a slot machine, I guess it pulled action zero, and I got a cookie. Um, so my reward uh, matrix now knows about uh, the, uh, action one, and, and it's basically storing this. But I'm not, uh, I'm not actually going to use it yet because I, I'm still keeping my counts. So if we run this a bunch of times, I wonder if it's always taking, oh, it, it is always taking the same action. I'm actually wondering if it's this, the float error again. Um, let's try this. How many iterations does it do too? It's doing uh, like a thousand oh, iterations of the like outer cycle. Thirty, I guess. No. Yeah. It's still just picking that one instead of one of the other. Yeah. Um, let's look at my cheat sheet. So this was from the train this morning. Oh, you had to do something else, I think. You had to set this guy. That looks the same. That actually might not be necessary because it's not going to think about SR anymore. But no. All right. So I'm just going to copy this one in. R max in class. And here's the one that I tested this morning. All right, so that one worked. Yay. Um, so we can take a look if you want. I'm not seeing. It's probably some kind of typo. Uh, so this is. Um, I don't know if I'm going to try to remember what we did before, but basically this is doing the same thing. Uh, it's doing this uh, update. It's updating the, the uh, reward estimates, <coughs> updating our counts, updating the reward estimates, updating the transition matrix, and uh, setting our defaults. And when we do it, it works. Um, so we're doing far better, again, <coughs> than, than random, although not quite as good as, as Thompson sampling. Okay. Uh, and it's not clear, like, like like, so, so when I, I still feel this way about reinforcement learning. It's kind of like this alphabet soup. Like people talk about all these different reinforcement learning algorithms. There's all these different ways to do it, and it's really unclear to me like when to use what and, and why. So, so there's a few things that are that are clear. Like if you can actually do something like Thompson sampling, it seems like generally a pretty a pretty good idea. So that's like like if you can actually solve things exactly if everything matches your your model, then is probably the right thing. Um, Q learning is really simple, so if you don't really want to think too hard, that's probably a good option, or SARSA, so, so these value-based methods. And then even simpler are the policy-based methods, uh, but they're more susceptible to local maxima. But those are the ones that have had the mo uh, probably the most success in big problems in, in practice. Um, the model-based methods are nice because you get some kind of, you get a model, and you can use it for other things besides just you know, solving the, the MDP. You can you can do roll you can do rollout based methods to solve it, and you can kind of understand what it's learning about the world. You can actually look at R and look at T and and get some intuition about about what's happening. Uh, but there, I don't feel like there's like there's like you know just like in machine learning like there's alphabet soup between SVMs and decision trees and and all the different methods, they, they sort of all have different trade-offs. And I think we, as a field, are sort of trying, one of the questions we're trying to answer is how can we figure out what algorithm to use when, or maybe come up with an algorithm that beats them all, that sort of gets the advantages of, of all of them at the same time. OK, so that's RMAX, um, at least for, for bandit problems and you know, at least one version. Uh, I apologize about the bug. I hope it's not too bad. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is 
policy search. So let's go back to our spectrum here. So, so model-based, we were actually estimating a transition matrix, estimating a reward function, using that to compute a Q function, <coughs> and then using that to get a policy. Um, in value function based, we're estimating the Q function, and then we're using that to get the policy. In policy based, we're going to directly get a policy. We're just going to try to find uh, uh, actions that maximize our expected reward. So there's different ways you could do this. Um, in the sort of most general way, you can just imagine iterating through all the possible policies. So in our slot machine world, if, if data is no limit, you can just try pulling slot one for a while, see how much you get, and then try pulling slot two for a while and see how much you get, and then try pulling slot three for a while. And then once you do that, you pick the best one and you do that forever after. Um, it's a version of, so we were doing this sort of explore then exploit in our bandit problems for, for Q learning, but with policy search, we're not going to actually estimate the value function when we do our exploration. We're just going to try that policy and, and store the, how much reward it got and then keep going. Does that kind of make sense? It's, 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 very, it's supposed to be very straightforward. Like you just try this policy and then try another policy and try another policy. Um, but of course, there, usually the space of policies is too big to actually en enumerate. So what we do instead is uh, tip, so, so one thing we, like this is sort of one path you can go down, but like you param well, well high level thing is you can parameterize the policy somehow. So you have some parameters theta, and once you have a theta, you plug it into some function, which I haven't told you yet, and that gives you a policy. And that can be a deterministic policy where it just tell, I just look it up and it tells me what action I should be taking. Or uh, more frequently, it's a probabilistic, non deterministic policy. So you can build an exploration in this way. Um, so here, um, the, the thing we're going to do is a probabilistic policy. So it's going to be the probability of an action given the state and your model parameters data. And it's just going to try to, and, and, and when we use this policy, we're going to sample, you can do two things. One is you can sample an action from your policy, and the second is uh, you can just argmax. You can just take the most probable policy that it says. And if you sample, you get this nice exploration that kind of happens for free. So does anybody want to guess what this uh, could look like? Or suggest something that this could look like? <coughs> yep. Would that be the um, payoff probabilities of each of the machines? Yeah, so you could estimate the probability of a payoff for taking, for taking different actions. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, but how could you, so, so typically this is done by assuming a functional form for the policy, right? So like you're going to make this into some parameterized probability distribution, right? So what, what could that look like? There's not like there's one right answer, there's multiple possible answers. But there's one we've used a lot in class. In the machine learning section, yeah? You mean, would you just have kind of like a Gaussian over all the different actions? Yeah, you could have a Gaussian over your actions. You might do like a mixture of Gaussians, for example, and then your parameters, what would your thetas be in that case? What are the parameters of a Gaussian? Mm. Yeah, means and variances. So, so you'd be tweaking the means and the variances of your, of your Gaussians, and, and uh, somehow that would tell you which action you're, you're supposed to be picking. Yeah. But so how, how would you discretize the Gaussian? Um, you, you would have to, let's see, so, so, so that, that would make more, like, so doing something like that would make more sense when you had a more continuous action space. And then, and then you would be drawing an action from some place around where the Gaussian is. And it would, it would sort of estimate the likelihood of or the reward or the, the goodness, not necessarily even reward, just the goodness of nearby actions based on how well other actions in that space work. So there's something called a Gaussian process, if you ever heard of that. That's kind of like, that kind of does this. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's related to the Bayes filter, particle filter stuff we were talking about. It's another take on it in continuous action spaces with Gaussians. Um, what about when it's discrete? What, what, what could we do? What do we do for our logistic regression?
So, so, so does this look like what we had for classification, kind of, maybe? A little bit? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so remember classification, we were talking, we used, we used different variables, right? But we had probability of y given x beta. And we had naive Bayes, we had logistic regression, and x was all kinds of different things. Sometimes it was a uh, feature vector, and, and, th and then what was y? What was y? Yeah, a category. So like you know, you'd had y one and y two and y three, da da da. da. <coughs> okay. So I had some list, finite small list of y's, and I had a feature vector of x's, and I and I basically had my parameters, and I and I did, you know, an update. Okay. And then and then we had remember like naive Bayes logistic regression. We had different ways of parameterizing the world. DK talked about this in the in the Tom Mitchell chapter that we read, um, but it basically all worked out to estimating this distribution. So d will that work here? Yeah, it, it does, right? So, so, so you're nodding. Do you want to say why you think it works? No, I was shrugging. I didn't oh, you didn't know. <laughs> okay. So anybody? So, so I think it does work. Does anybody agree with me, or anybody think it doesn't work, or we can talk about it? You're looking confused. Would we be doing this generatively, or are you, like we, we wouldn't be applying Bayes' law, right? Because we can't really predict s and beta. Here. Yeah, so we can. So we're going to do this with the logistic regressor, essentially a log linear model. Um, and the way, and, and I haven't told you how we're going to update our features yet. So so and, and we'll get to that, like the you know the bottom of the slide. Um, and and in our logistic regressor, we were doing stochastic gradient descent. If you remember to to optimize our model parameters. It turns out we can do the same kind of thing here to, to update it. But first, let's just think about like the parametric form for what this can be. So what's the parametric form for logistic regression in y given x? What's it start with? What's it look like? E to the something. Yeah, e to the something. Good. E to the something. And, and is that all, or is there some more stuff? Divided by. Divided by. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a z. This is what we always do when we don't want to write it all out. There's just 1 over z to make it sum to 1, remember? And what is the something? What goes up there? Um, yeah, so, so 1 over 1 minus something is, is sort of equivalent. Like, it'll simplify to this. Um, but I'm asking for what goes inside this exponent. So, so don't look at your notes. Think about it. All right. So, so, so what are what? Just to, before we write down like the form of it, like what do we have? Right. So x is like going to be a feature vector, right? And theta is going to be a feature vector. So there's going to so so what do you think is going to be in here? Like like probably some x's and some thetas, right? Yeah. So what are we going to do to our x's and our thetas? You had your hand up. No. Okay. Yeah. Your right. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dot them together. X dot theta. Okay. And and if we want, we can write out the the z. Um, so it's gonna be the summation. Actually, we have to do a little bit more of a trick because we have to do we have to put our y's in here too. I haven't told you about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so we have to we have to basically have features for the two different classes to make this work. Otherwise, it's degenerate because it, it'll basically be the same no matter what y actually is. So typically, you do this by, by having the Cartesian product. So you'll have x, like if there's two classes, you'll have y0, x0, y0, xn, y1, x0, y1, xn, dot, 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 dot. OK? So, so more generally, um, you can say this by having features functions of x and y, and you'll sum over theta i. OK? Is that kind of OK? So this is a linear combination of weighted features. And we're exponentiating it um, with this 1 over z to make it into a probability. OK? All right. And what you said before, the sigmoid stuff, the 1 over 1 minus stuff, 
That is what happens when you have a two-class version of this whole world. It simplifies to that. Um, but this is the more general multinomial, multi-class multi version. So here, are we in two classes or multiple classes? Multiple classes. OK. So, so what this looks like, here it is um, in slides. So we're going to have some feature functions of the states and the actions. And you can get these in a you know, number of, like if, if your x's are already featureized, it's just you know, reproducing the x's with the Cartesian product. If they're not, you might actually be compute, like coming up with them, dreaming them up however you, you, get, you want. And then you have your feature weights and then our, our normalizer. So this is probability of A, so we're dividing over all the actions of the same thing. So this kind of pattern of like this thing divided by summing over everything to magically make it into a probability distribution is very common, this, this sort of um, this functional form of, of, of the world. Um, it didn't have to be an exponent for this to work. We could put anything in here as long as this didn't end up being 0. And it would be a probability, right? It would, it would still sum to 1. But this is a nice functional form. It's differentiable, and, and it's got nice conjugate priors and all that, all that jazz. Um, so, so lots of people use this. And in the, in the book, we talked about it briefly in, in class last time. So, so, what we're, so what now what do we have to do to, to actually you know, estimate this model? Yeah, we have to somehow update our feature weights, right? We have to come up with thetas that, that are better than, than, than just the default versions of the thetas. Um, so I, I call, they, the book calls these features cues. They don't have, you, you, could, you could sort of pretend, and we'll do something kind of similar, like your features could be the, the, some way of getting the Q value of the state. But it's not, it was actually confusing to me, so I took it out of the equation. I didn't take it out of my slide, so I apologize for that. But you can initialize your feature weights to 0. Pretend that says theta. Let's make it say theta. There. I won't. All right, OK. So initialize the theta is to 0. And then for each iteration, what we're going to do is sample an action history from the policy. OK. So I'm just going to pick an action and get a reward. Uh, in the general version, you might do a full history. So, you, so, so if you want this to take into account the future, you can't just do a local update. You have to actually see how well that policy works in the long term. And then um, execute it, get, your some, get some reward back. And then uh, update the thetas in proportion to the reward times the gradient. OK? So we're going to compute the gradient of this. And because we picked this nice e function, e to the stuff, the gradient is something we can compute. It takes you know, like a few whiteboards of derivatives and calculus. Um, I've done it because we had a paper where we had to do this with a factored version. It was really fun. We had to use the product rule in addition to the um, chain rule. For it. it was lots of algebra. But we did it. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's actually not that bad um, or scary, but it's also not that relevant to AI. So we're not going to do it here. But I'm going to give you what it, what it is so we can think about it. So this is the log uh, probability instead of the probability. Um, so this is what our update's actually going to look like um, for a particular feature and a particular feature weight. So this is the partial derivative with respect to theta, one, one specific theta sub i of, uh, uh, of, this, of this function. So what does this look like to you? So what's this term? What it was before. So yes, yeah, so what is it in words? Like, like, so what's our fees? What's, a, what's one particular fee? It's a feature, yeah. It's the actual feature value that I observed. Okay, what's this term? So what does this look like? What's a summation over something times the probability of something? Kind of. It's expected value. Yeah, this is an expected value. Okay. And this falls out of the e, because it's e, the derivative of e is to itself and stuff. This happens uh, because of that. This is an expected value of what? Like yeah. Or well, just of the state, or all the actions can be on the state. Yeah, well, it's the expected value of, of this feature <laughs> over all the actions. So it's basically like an error term, right? Like this is the, val the action that I actually took. And this is the action, this is like the, the you know, corrected by all the actions I could have taken. OK? So to make this, um, and this is basically saying that this is a gradient, right? So like this is how, the, the sort of difference between what I did and what my model thought I should have done. 
to make this into an update, like to make it push in the right direction, what do I have to do with this quantity? I think it says on the slide, too. It says it right here. Yeah. Yeah, it has to factor in the reward. So, so why do I have to factor in the reward? What if I don't? Yeah, it has no idea what direction to update in, right? So, so this is going to change something. But if my actual action was good, I want to go, I want to increase that feature weight, right? Like if the action that I picked was good, I want to go in the, in the positive direction. If it was a bad action, I've got negative reward, I want to go in another, in the negative direction. I want to decrease that feature weight. I don't want to pick that action again, kind of intuitively, right? Um, so, so, so that's why I have to multiply by, by the reward. Um, so, so again, this, this equation comes from taking the derivative of this with respect to um, theta. But it actually has a pretty intuitive interpretation. So, so don't get scared, even if it has a derivative in it. Um, the, the, the way that it's doing its update is kind of natural. All right, so now let's, yeah, question. What are the actual features here? Yeah, they, they can be lots of different things. So if you remember, this is the algorithm that the Bronovan paper used from the beginning of uh, the semester. Um, and their features were things that they computed about Windows. So like which button was currently open and which things had the uh, focus and, and you know, stuff like that. Like thinking hard about what, the, what would be useful in the domain. You could use also tabular features. So you could just say, and that's what we'll do in our bandit problem actually. We could just say, well, my features are whatever state I'm in right now. And then, and then uh, do this update uh, in terms of the, of the actions. Um, the feature, and, and when we talk in the last part of the class, we're going to talk about deep reinforcement learning. That's kind of exactly the, the angst about a lot of these algorithms, right? We, we have to come up with good features, and if we do, everything is easy, and if we don't, everything is hard. So the magic of deep learning is like, well, we'll come up with good features for you if you have lots of GPUs and lots of computation time. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the, the next part. So let's do it. Um, so here is policy search. And let me go add it back in to our, to our world. Policy search. All right, and this guy right now at the beginning of the world is is basically doing nothing. So my parameters, my thetas, are, are initialized all to zero. And I'm setting my probabilities to be, to be one, and I'm just doing, I'm doing nothing. So the first thing I'm going to do, and actually let's print the probabilities, because that's kind of the, the thing that we're maintaining, the distribution, of just a multinomial distribution over the best action to take at, a, at any time step. And then I'll do a raw input, and then I'll do main. I'm actually going to take out just so it runs a little faster. <coughs> Let's take out the other ones. I'll take out that one too. Oh wait, here we go. So so we'll probabilities are one one one, and then I'm going to pick the best one and go from there. This would just does the same thing over and over again, does nothing. All right, so, so what do I really want to do to get my probabilities? I want to loop over all the, all the actions, and I want to do that equation over there on the whiteboard, or it's also on my slide. This equation. So let's do that, OK? So math.e math dot pow e to the I'm going to actually do an even simpler version where the features are just going to directly this I'm going to maintain this parameter as, as the feature I'm going to have a feature for each action just to wait for for how much each action goes um, so I need an a i a and enumerate banded dot actions params let's do this 
over over what? Sum over algebra. Yeah, and a dot sum um, math dot pow math dot e params a i prime for a i prime <coughs> a prime in enumerate bandit dot action. See if I get all my friends right. No, that's wrong. Maybe I should do this all with list comprehensions. <laughs> um, all right. All right. It looks good, though. All right. So here's what we did. We we initialized our parameters to zeros, and now when we did our normalization and we get a uniform distribution, OK? And, and then to test this, what we can do is say, well, let's say like params 0 equals 1. Um, what that's going to do is update, you know, it's going to make it more likely to choose action number 1 and less likely to choose action number 0. So now if I do params sub 1 as well, you can see these two are indifferent, and this one is much less likely. So now we're going to do, what, what can we do? Um, how should we update our parameters? Draw an action. That's already there, actually. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, draw an action, and then. And then calculate the, um, whatever that thing is, and multiply by Yeah, the yeah, so we can, we can do that. And um, that actually works out to be something re uh, really simple. This is like a sort of almost a hack, I feel like. Um, in, this, in this world where we just get to observe the reward and there's only one action and our features are like all collapsed, um, we're going to do something. We're just going to add our, our parameters are going to be the observed reward <coughs> for that state. Okay? So our bookkeeping, so it's actually already happening here. It's going to, um, every time we take an action, we're going to update our parameter with the observed reward. And we're going to cap it because we're doing this probability exactly. And our, I was getting an overflow error if I didn't cap it. So, <laughs> so otherwise, it would explode. If you did log probabilities, which we could have, I could have also done, then it wouldn't overflow. But then you don't get these nice, pretty probabilities. You can look at. Um, OK, so let's try it. Let's take out the raw input. All right, and it's doing really well. So, so this is, was actually surprising to me. I thought that um, Thompson sampling would outperform policy gradients, but I actually got fairly, like with this, you know, really, I, didn't, I, don't even, I couldn't even find this in the, like this is, I just made this up this morning, basically. Like, we'll just try adding the rewards as the features. And it was performing very consistently with Thompson sampling. So here it beat uh, Thompson sampling. And it turns out, like, 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 so I haven't, like I'm running this with not very many samples and with one fixed uh, setting of, of the model parameters. So like, I don't want to claim that this is good. I actually don't know the, the relation between this, this algorithm that we just came up with and Thompson sampling. Um, it seems like it's doing something kind of similar to what Thompson sampling is doing in terms of the way it's storing the counts and, and doing this exponential family thing. Uh, it seems like you'd kind of like it if you, we did all this stuff with the beta distribution last week and we integrated and and, and we had this prior, and we felt like we were being really nice Bayesians. And you'd kind of like it if all of that work you know, resulted in better performance than, than doing this kind of hack with the exponential families. But it turned, uh, it turned out, in at least the, the, time, like the, the ways that I was running, that it, there wasn't really a clear difference between the two approaches. Um, often, policy gradient was outperforming Thompson sampling. So I'm actually going to try maybe running it like a lot of data to, to really try to get uh, estimate on what performs better in the limit. But like, at least with our preliminary experience, exper with my preliminary experience, experiments uh, in class, like, like this is actually kind of amazing. So and the policy gradient's doing really well. Um, so actually, the one thing I did notice, like, so in this world, I had the, these kind of peaky probabilities. I, I made them more similar. So here, it's going to be, uh, I broke the comma, will that work? Oh, all right. So if the probabilities were more closer, it seemed like 
Thompson sampling was, was closer to policy search. So here, the world is less happy, right? So even an ensemble policy doesn't do that well. But policy search is still leaning. I, so when, when I was writing this at home uh, before class, it seemed like Thompson sampling was doing better when it was more closer. But I'm really just making up ideas. I don't actually know. So um, what's interesting about this uh, you know, is even though I wasn't expecting to see this pattern in this very simple world, like uh, where a policy grading algorithm, because it's kind of got fewer parameters, it's just trying to pick the, th the, the best action to take. It's somehow, I, I, my theory about it is that if it is better than, than Thompson sampling, it's because we're making more assumptions about what the policy actually looks like than Thompson sampling is. So the Thompson sampling was trying to estimate the state of the world, and that might, you know, um, that might not accurately reflect what the, the true, oh, here's Thompson sampling actually is doing better. These are negative. So <laughs> yeah, we have to invert them. So when they're closer, it seemed like it was doing better than when they're farther away. And I think, I think what that, what's happening is that the policy gradient is just very quickly jumping <coughs> onto a good, po like the, the one that looks good and, and exploiting. So when there's a big difference, it's able to recognize that quickly and just do it. Where Thompson sampling is using this beta prior, it's, it's a little bit slower to um, converge. So, so my theory is basically um, in this particular world where it was peaky up here, where it was 0.8 versus 0.3 and 4, there's a big difference. The policy gradient version was able to do really well because uh, it exploits that. Whereas when you have a a uh, more close world where, where there's not that much different, the, the policy gradient is the, doing less well because it's going to jump on the wrong thing. Yes? Well, I thought they were all kind of like 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.1. Like 0 0.8, 0 0.8, like 0 0.95 or something. 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.95. Where it's, they're all very close, but you know, not. I think the same thing, like that, uh, that policy search is going to, yeah, like, like when, when there's not that much of a difference. Um, and and the, uh, so the thing, experiment I was running, trying to run to test this was actually not just running it on one uh, arm settings, but actually randomly sampling the arm parameters the way that we assumed that we would for our, uh, our Bayesian version of the world and then, and then uh, seeing what happens there. So that's the experiment that I'm going to run to actually see what happens in the, in the limit. Question? It seems like at a high level, these yeah. are essentially doing the same. <coughs> It does, so yeah, it does. It's using a logistic function, not a beta distribution. Yeah, and maybe maybe I'm getting hung up on the details of it, but like you know, if there, like the, the thing, the thing I don't know the answer. Like, so it feels very similar, the way that the updates are happening, the type of bookkeeping that both algorithms were doing, the fact that they're both sampling an action from a distribution, and, you know, in a kind of a similar way. Um, so, so what I don't understand is, so, 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 but there's a question which maybe isn't even worth trying to find the answer to, but there's a question that I don't know the answer to, which is, are they doing the same thing or not? And if they're not doing the same thing, is one better in the limit or not, and why? Yes? W would it be possible to use like a beta distribution instead of a logistic function here and then see if they actually converge equally quickly? Or is the math for that? Well, a beta distribution is over zeros and one, zero to one. What you'd want to use, I think, is a Dirichlet prior. So, so, so a Dirichlet distribution is a generalization of the beta distribution. So remember, beta distribution was drawing one um, view in our, in our last lecture between zero and one. And then that was giving us a coin that we were flipping. Um, the Dirichlet is a generalization of that. So if I have a dice, right, and it's a weighted dice, so I'm going to roll my dice and I don't know uh, let's say there's six sides, and I don't know which one is more likely. A Dirichlet is going to draw weights for the, for the die. So distribution over um, distributions over multinomials. So I think it might be the case that if we used a Dirichlet just prior over the weights and then, and then, and then did all the math of, of that, um, that, that we could come up with a version of a policy gradient version of Thompson, of Thompson sampling. And there's sort of the, you know, the, this whole space we could explore if we wanted to stay just in banded problems. And probably people have done this, too. I, there might be papers out there that I haven't um, explored. Uh, so we're not going to, you know, we're going to really, you know, let go of bandits now soon. But um, I, I hope that you kind of see the, the, the point of this was more to give you a tour of, of different types of RL, RL algorithms, help you have a framework to, to put them in so that when you encounter a new one or when you need one for your problem you know, next year or in the next 10 years, you can kind of come back 
to this framework and say, well, maybe I should try a model-based method because I want to know what my reward function is and what my transition function is. Or maybe I already know something about it. I can give it a really good initialization. Or I think I have a really good policy class. The, cl the space of models is really big, but I think I can have a really good pol small class of policies. So I'm going to try policy-based method. Or I just want to try something quick, so I'm going to do Q-learning. Does that, does that kind of make sense? OK. So we're not, we're going we're gonna, to, um, I will run this experiment and, and let you guys know over, over lots of, uh, of samples. But we're going to let go you know, the, the exact differences between the two. Just, I'll just leave you with those questions. If you feel excited about them, you can think about them more. OK. So any more questions before we let go of all, of all this? Not completely let go, but like. All right, so we're going to go to policy search, um, deep reinforcement learning. Um, so who's ever, we've talked already a little bit about deep learning, I think. Uh, so it is, this is a paper that I, uh, so, so Ms. one of my students and I are, are starting to try to think about deep reinforcement learning and how it can apply to Minecraft and all this other stuff that we're thinking about. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to talk about it in class today. Um, because there's a lot of, so, so the, the idea behind deep learning is to do you have these like cascades of neural networks. You give them lots of data and you give them GPUs so that they can train really <laughs> fast. And they've gotten really state of the art results on speech recognition, on image classification, and, and reinforcement learning. And we're going to talk about the, the reinforcement learning applications today. Just to give you familiarity with um, one of the coolest things in AI out there right now. And they're making a lot of claims. So this was a uh, paper that came out in 2012, Deep Reinforcement Learning as a Foundation for Artificial General Intelligence. Like, they think this is going to, you know, give us, you know, the, um, you know, the singularity or something. Uh, and it's actually, you know, scarier than that. There's this company called Deep Mind Technologies. Who's heard of them? I think we talked about them before in class. Um, so their mission is to build general purpose learning algorithms. They were bought by Google in January, this past January, right before we started, for $650 million. Um, we don't actually know how much, but that's what the, the newspaper articles think. Um, and they do deep learning. They, they do this stuff. Uh, and they, ha they agreed, this is an interesting thing I learned at, at Google. They agreed, this is, you can find this on the internet. They agreed to found an ethics board, Google did, to ensure that DeepMind's artificial intelligence technology is not abused. So, so this, is, this is a very interesting use of passive voice. So, so when I first read this, <laughs> I thought that they, <laughs> I thought that they they wanted to make sure that this amazing new technology was not going to be used to hurt people. Um, when I was at Google, I found out that actually they're concerned about <laughs> the AIs. Um, so the point of the ethics board, it, so seriously, like I, I actually believe this is true, um, that the point of the ethics board is jointly to protect people and also the general purpose AI that they think that they're going to make. Um, so it's kind of scary when you, when, when you find that out, <laughs> um, that a company like Google is taking this that seriously um, uh, to, to make an ethics board for it. So, so what is deep learning? Uh, and this is actually very timely. So this was on the train this morning. I read this headline on Hacker News. Google's Street View computer vision can beat reCAPTCHA with 99% accuracy. So you guys know what reCAPTCHA is? These like inverse Turing tests where you see these really weird distorted letters or maybe something from an OCR and you type it in and it knows you that you're a human. Um, so, so they made a system, there's a paper that you can go read that does that and it beats people. It's better than people at it. <laughs> um, here's some examples of, of, of text that they were able to accurately read um, using the system from the paper. Uh, so you can see that some of it's very challenging. Like I don't, even, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Uh, maybe 66, yeah, 101. Like these are really hard. And the way that this they did this is with deep learning. Uh, so so this is and this was today, this morning in Hacker News, and I was like, wow, it's very relevant. Um, so so deep learning seems like it has a lot of power. Like there's there's some and it's very timely. Like these these things are just coming out. Um, and there's an interesting paper that came out in 2012. It's called Playing Atari with Deep Reinforcement Learning. So who's heard of Atari? Lots of, yeah, good, OK. So like, these are some of the games. This is Pong. This, is, th this thing learns to play, these games. So um, you're trying to bounce this little ball back and forth. And if it, if it hits the goal, you lose. 
Um, you're trying to hit your opponent's goal, basically. Breakout, uh, so you're trying to hit the, it's like Pong, but you're trying to make these things disappear. Um, and and uh, as fast as you can, you get points for doing that. Spa the old favorite, Space Invaders. Um, this was one of the projects in the, in the course last year, was making a uh, computer vision system for Space Invaders. So these little guys are coming down, you're trying to shoot them, and you're trying not to get hit by, by their missiles. And then I have never actually heard of these two. This is Sequest. You're a submarine. I guess there's fish. I don't know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Beam Rider. This one looks kind of fun, too. It's kind of 3D, I think. I don't know. You're like zooming around. I don't know if you're racing or what. And there's actually this um, tool set for RL, which um, has, it's got this Atari emulator, and it's got all these Atari games. And they have results for Sarsa and Q Learning and, and stuff. And, and, and you can basically play Atari with your RL thing. So it's, uh, the input is RGB video at 60 hertz of the screen. So you're asking the emulator for a, an RGB image of, 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 of like this. Um, the actions are 18 discrete actions defined by the joystick controller. So, yep, moving the little joystick around. I think you can push some buttons, too. Uh, so each time step, you get to pick an action. And then the idea is from, th and you also get to know the game score. So the game score is not, like, it is in the, it is, it's here, but you also get it as a number. You don't actually have to do, learn to do OCR. Like, we somehow have to tell it what we want our algorithm to do in an external reward signal. Uh, okay, uh, so what it's going to do is at each time step, it's going to select an action, uh, AT, observe an image, XT, receive a reward, RT. And the reward could be delayed. So like in Space Invaders, your action might be to shoot, and then, you know, a second later, it's going to hit the alien, and the alien's going to disappear, <coughs> and then you get your reward. Um, and that might be, um, if this is happening at 60 hertz, that might be uh, 60 frames later, 60 steps later in your, in your MDP. So, um, so what they're doing in, in, this, in this paper is having the state be not the individual state, but the history of all the states that you've been in. So, um, and, they'll, and they'll roll it back to a finite window. So the last you know, 60 seconds of play or something um, gives you the sequence of states and actions. And then they're trying to um, figure out which action to do. So they're going to push a button on the controller. The transition function runs the Atari emulator, so it's just whatever the, like back in the, I don't, when did Atari come out? The 80s? 80s, yeah. So back in the 80s, whenever those people programmed those games, that's the transition function that we're going to use. So whatever, that, whatever happens because of the emulator, we don't know it, but we have to infer it. And the reward is the game score. So they, we do get to know that. Um, so people do this uh, with linear function approximation. We talked about this before in, in class. This is just the math of this um, linear function approximation for, for Q learning. We could also have done it with a logistic regressor, too. Um, it's nice because there's convergence guarantees. It's bad because we have to give it features, and it can only learn linear functions. So the idea behind deep learning goes back to this old idea in AI, which we didn't talk about in our machine learning, but it's another thing in the family of our machine learning toolboxes, right there along with SVMs and decision trees. Um, it's something called a neural network. And this is from the book. This is a picture of a, of a mathematical model for a neuron. This was inspired by what we know about our brains and how a neuron in our brain kind of works. So what you have is like these, these axons that connect to other things <coughs> in your brain and they're active or they're not active. So they're firing or they're not firing. And then each uh, thing coming in has a weight. Each axon coming in has a weight that says how important that is. Then you have some, uh, and then you do usually you do a weighted sum, a linear combination of these. Then you have some nonlinear function. So this can be a step function, so 0 or 1. If it's over a threshold, I'll be on. If it's under a threshold, I'll be off. Or it could be a sigmoid, so one of our exponential family kind of things, uh, that tells me how much I turn on. Uh, and then I decide whether to output. And I could have one or more output links. OK, so this is like a little transistor in our brain, right? It's like one little computational element that can, you know, takes this input, does linear combination, turns it on, turns it off. Um, and if I, you know, depending on what I put in here, I could make this be like an SVM or I could make this be like a logistic regressor, right? If these are my features, my weights are my feature weights, and my output is my class, like maybe I'm going to output on one of the three uh, action channels, or zero or one, let's say I'm going to activate or not activate, then I can stick whatever classifier I want inside here. Um, so, so what gets interesting is not when I have one of these, but when I have lots of them. 
Um, so here's uh, one with two uh, neurons, and here's one with a hidden layer. So I have my input layer, and then those connect to a hidden layer, and then those connect to the output layer. Um, and just like with transistors, like uh, you know, you could wire them up in all kinds of different ways, and you can get you know the Turing test, right? You can get any possible computation uh, that you want with with these neurons. You can wire them up in many different ways and to get many different uh, functions as output. Uh, so the way that they've wired this one up, they sort of have these connections. They have every every possible connections, and then what it's learning is the weights. So so it's sort of learning well if these weights are really high and these other weights are really low. The practical effect is going to be to removing weight, these arrows as it, as it's learning weights. Kind of does that make sense? As we learn to upweight some things and downweight other things. If limit if this weight's zero, it might as well not even exist. And that kind of matches what our brains do. Like we know a lot of what happens when kids are, are born and they and they sort of go through early childhood, they start out with very connected brains. Like their neurons are connected to lots of other neurons. And as you learn, what you're doing is pruning connections. There's the adult brain is much less connected than the baby, the child's brain. Um, and, and what that lets you do, like you, you, that's sort of what the learning process kind of looks like. So this is all like, why people thought neurons were, were cool. Um, uh, and there's this sort of, it's interesting looking at the history of this, so we're going to briefly talk about this. They proposed a long time ago, in 1936, was the, what the book said was the earliest paper. Um, there was this book that came out in 1969 called per Perceptrons by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. These are sort of the grandfathers uh, of AI. Um, they're the founders of AI. And the book basically said, well, single layer perceptrons can only do linearly separable functions. So what that said is what we said before. This guy, is, you can just basically stick any machine learning algorithm you want inside of that, and you know, it's uh, linear combinations of stuff, and you can't do things that are nonlinear. So it's not really that different from what we had before. Um, um, and we don't know how to train multilayer networks. So these networks, even though in theory, they can do really complicated things. We can wire them up in all kinds of crazy ways. In practice, we don't know how to train them. So then we got this algorithm called backpropagation, which said, well, actually, we can train them. Um, and it, it basically does stochastic gradient ascent in, in a special way on, on the derivatives. Uh, and, and, and it kind of works. But the problem is that it's very slow to converge. So people were training their neural networks for like three days. and you know, it would perform comparably to stochastic, so like a log linear model or something. And they would also think a lot about this structure. So they would be like, well, I'm going to try one hidden layer and I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to decide where I'm going to put the weights and not put the weights. And so what happened is because of this, because the training took so long and it was so twitchy the way that you wired up your network, people were like, well, okay, neural networks aren't cool anymore. And they started using SVMs and, and stuff like that. They, they, got, they got not cool. Um, so, so until 2007, uh, so Jeff Hinton wrote this paper called Learning Multiple Layers of Representation. And what that did is basically said, well, here's how to take one of these generally connected networks uh, that, you know, we, we had the backpropagation algorithm that was really slow, and it was a trick to train it fast. So there's this trick where you train it layer by layer in an unsupervised way. And the, and it's still slow. It's, not, it's faster than backpropagation, but it's still slow. But the other thing that's changed is we have GPUs now. Um, so, so your GPU, like your NVIDIA graphics card or something, can run. They, they basically figured out how to run the training stuff on the GPU so that it goes super, super fast in parallel. So now you're still training these methods for like three days or, or longer. But the, the amount of computation that they're doing in that time is much, much, much more than it was in the 60s when they, when they st first started playing around with these types of techniques. And so they're getting much, much better results um, as a result. So this is like the, the sort of deep learning insight that happened, that we can train these big networks um, with lots and lots of data really quickly with an algorithmic trick and with like this particular hardware advance um, that people did. So um, the, the, the paper about deep RL uses the Bellman equation, just like our, you know, a lot of our other algorithms, um, but basically approximating this Q function with a deep belief network. So I haven't really told you <laughs> the, the, the details of that, but you can think of it as um, a network like this one with lots of hidden layers and lots of connections that it's training on lots and lots of data using the GPU 
and um, Hinton's trick. Um, so here's their algorithm, and and they're sort of talking. They do this thing of of replaying, right? So they're gonna they 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 collect their data and they expose their algorithm to it multiple many many times to to do lots and lots of updates. Um, it's a gradient accept update. They do this mini batch thing, and 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 you know, so basically they think for a really long time. And the output of this is um, a policy. So, so, and it's also interesting. They're doing. I thought that they were doing epsilon greedy, which we talked about before. Is like, you see this coming up all the time. It's a very simple way to, to guarantee exploration. So they're training for 10 million frames per game. Um, so that's about four. I think that's about 40 hours, or 46 hours. I worked it out of playing Atari. So, th so this thing plays Space Invaders for 46 hours. Um, maybe even longer because it's it's getting that data and then it's replaying, right? Like it's it's doing these these batches, so it's like dreaming <laughs> about Space Invaders <laughs> um, as it's doing these gradient updates. Um, they're doing this trick with one on every fourth frame, except for Space Invaders. <laughs> so this is a funny tidbit from the paper. Um, so at k equals four, the lasers are invisible because of the period at which they blink. So the the, the lasers that the enemies are firing at you. And so it couldn't play. Um, so for Space Invaders, they had to they run on every third frame. Um, for all the other games, every fourth frame worked really well. Um, that was the only trick they said that they had to, to, to make it work on specific games. And when you do this, it works. So, so, um, so this is showing like the baseline algorithms. I don't remember what contingency is, but Sarsa is kind of like Q-learning. Uh, and, and the DQN is the deep belief network, and the deep, deep Q-learning. Um, after it's being trained. So this is the score of the game. And this last row here is the human's score. Uh, so they had a human play. The human was really bad at Pong. <laughs> <Like, laughs> <laughs> uh, they had a human play for two hours to train, and then instead of 46 hours. Um, and what's that? For two hours of Pong, you're definitely be getting worse. Than yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, that's why, maybe that's why they're so bad. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, what's interesting is, is um, so they're, they're far outperforming the, the baseline RL algorithms. And they're, sometimes they're even beating, maybe the Pong thing is an exception, but sometimes they're, for Breakout, for example, they're beating the human. Um, so, and, and other games where they're, they're not, these involve, Space Invaders they're not very good at. Um, they said these games involve more longer term thinking and, and strategies. Uh, and the, the, the thing that's amazing when you, when you think about this is it's actually doing this on the pixels. So the input is an RGB image of Space Invaders over time. And it's learning from that uh, what features uh, predict good actions in a very unsupervised way. So it's really kind of amazing that it works. And I think like, where, where this is one of the state-of-the-art algorithms in, in RL uh, and, and deep learning. So I thought it would be fun to kind of expose you guys to it. Um, so to finish up, like our summary for today, we did RMAX, which is a model-based method. We did policy search, uh, where you just try to pick good actions with this exponential um, form of the policy distribution. And then we did a, a, a fun little uh, diversion into state-of-the-art reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning, and the, how AI is going to take over the world. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. See you next week. <laughs>